Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming and sitting for my talk. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to my uh, slide. Some strange line is appearing here. Sorry for that. First of all, sorry for my voice. I'm sick. I try to speak in a way that you can understand what I say. So um, my topic is investigating um, recent targeted attacks on APAC countries. Um, let me start by introducing myself. I'm sorry, just a second. Strange things happen. I'm Nushin Shabab. I'm senior security researcher uh, at Kaspersky Lab. Um, areas of interest for me are APT investigation. Uh, malware analysis, reverse engineering, and forensics analysis, anything that is uh, relevant to investigating cyber attacks. Uh, I've been with Kaspersky Lab for um, more than one year, one year and a half now. Before that, I was also um, working on in an um, antivirus um, company overseas, doing the same thing, malware analysis and reverse engineering. Um, in Kaspersky Lab, I'm part of a team which is called GREAT. GREAT stands for Global Research and Analysis Team. We are about 40 people um, all around the world working on different cyber attacks, um, focusing on the same region that we are based in. Um, that's why I'm talking about um, attacks on APAC countries. Um, my main focus is on Australia and New Zealand and then other countries in APAC region. The people you see in this uh, picture or part of the uh, um, part of the great team. Um, we work very close with our uh, CEO, and we we are the um, the research um, team of the company. Like if if you ever um, saw and um, in, in, um, see a webinar or um, read a report from the company, um, this is what our team does. Talking about the research that uh, we have been doing during the years, it, uh, the big research topics and big cyber attacks that we have been investigating during the years that started with Stuxnet in 2010. I'm sure that all of you know about the Stuxnet. It was a very big uh, cyber attack. It was actually a revolution in cyber threats. And then you can see in this picture that in 2011, we investigated another big, uh, big cyber threat and then in 2012, a few uh, big cyber threats we worked on. In 2013, you can see that there are more than five, six. In 2014, 15, and 16, you can see that there are a lot of big cyber threats that we have worked on. So it means that these targeted attacks and big cyber threats and uh, what, uh, what we call it APTs, advanced persistent threats, they are not uh, on a con uh, some kind of industry in a um, far country in like Middle East anymore. It's everywhere on every industry and every um, country. Um, so that's um, why it's very important to investigate these cyber threats and know their techniques and their intentions and what they do and what they and predict what they want to do next. Talking about cyber espionage and cyber threats in uh, APAC countries, um, if you see this, uh, if you uh, notice these logos in the um, previous slide, we make different logos for different APTs that we work on. So as you see here, there are different examples um, of cyber, big cyber threats and cyber espionage campaigns happening in APAC countries. There are, uh, these are some examples of what we worked on. Um, that the uh, upper ones are um, current um, cyber threats and cyber espionage campaigns targeting APAC countries, and the bottom one are um, the threats that are originating from APAC countries. And maybe the targets are APAC countries as well. I don't, s don't think you can see the slide completely. Okay. 
So uh, let me talk about some historic uh, cyber threats and some major cyber espionage campaigns that has happened on APAC countries. First of all, let me start with a big cyber threat, which is Regnin. It, um, it started in 2003, and as you see in the map, some of the APAC countries were among the main targets of this um, cyber espionage campaign. It was a very complex um, platform of cyber threats, and uh, it had rootkits, different trojans, and it was very advanced, and, um, and lots of com uh, countries have been among the targets of this APT actor. Another one, uh, which you can see some other APAC countries like India and Mongolia were among the targets, um, was um, Net Traveler. Uh, we investigated, we discovered this threat in 2013, but the first um, attacks has happened in 2004. And uh, it, it was again a toolkit of cyber espionage. Um, it, it had lots of um, tools and advanced techniques and um, um, and methods that they use uh, to attack the victims. Another one, which is a very recent one, it has started uh, in 2016, and we also discovered the threats in 2016 and it started working on it. It was a cyber espionage campaign operating um, out of India and some APAC countries like um, China and Australia are among the targets. The cyber espionage and uh, toolkit they are still very active, and they also adopt new techniques that uh, that is coming up to uh, attack more victims and to be up to date and use new uh, new techniques and methods every day. Uh, but now I want to talk about uh, a few um, very big cyber threats that is happening on um, APAC countries at the moment and are very current. First one is Lazarus. I'm sure that most of you know about Lazarus. It's an APT actor which has been active as, since uh, 2009, at least. And they have done many serious cyber threats in the past, like attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment in 2014, which was very big um, news. Another attack, another very serious attack that they, uh, they, um, they did was in 2013, uh, an attack on South Korea, which we call it Operation Troy. Another, th these are cyber espionage uh, attacks uh, with, uh, by Lazarus Group. Another one was again happened in 2013, we call it Operation Dark Soul. It, it also happened on South Korea. As you see, lots of, uh, the cyber espionage campaigns that they have been um, conducting and um, doing were on South Korea before, but then they uh, changed their um, their techniques and then they uh, they started uh, going after money as well. And there's an, there's a small subset of their it's not a small subset but it's a subset of their operations uh, which um, which more deals with money and uh, stealing money from different banks and different um, industries and organizations and companies that deal with money, which we call it Blunarov. We actually investigated these um, threats for about 10 months last year. We, uh, we did forensic investigation on many big banks that had been um, infected and attacked with this group and this subset group of Lazarus, and they um, and lots of APAC countries were also uh, among the targets of this um, of these attacks, and they are still ongoing. Still, we find new attacks and new um, techniques and new malwares every week and every day from this this group and this group of Lazarus. You can see in this map. Which, is, uh, which shows the geography map of the um, financial attacks by Lazarus Group. Um, many of the APAC countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, were among the targets. So why I'm talking about APAC countries is that these are the countries that are close to our countries. These are the countries that we deal with in our businesses and it's important if we, um, if we have uh, a business with a country 
that is a main target of many cyber attacks, it's important to know about these cyber attacks and be cautious about that. Another one which I, uh, I spent quite some few months on investigating their attacks, it's called the Spring Dragon. It's very interesting APT actor. It's been running since 2012 and the main targets are um, APAC countries, many of the APAC countries, and they're constantly um, expanding their targets to more countries. It has started with uh, some attacks on Taiwan and then they expanded their attacks on different uh, countries and different industries. They have a massive uh, scale of operation, like a few times more than many other APT actors that we see. Um, I, w I, I actually, I did reverse engineering on more than 700 customized backdoor samples of this APT actor, which is a lot compared to some other APTs, uh, compared to most of the APTs that we work on. They have a very big command and control infrastructure. They maintain more than 200 um, C2 servers and they use these C2 servers and different customized settings on different, uh, on different victims, so they, it makes the detection more difficult. Um, talking about the background of this research, it started in 2012, uh, and at that time there was a backdoor which was called Elisa backdoor. It was used in cyber espionage attacks against some countries in, um, in uh, APAC region, and um, some other researchers have worked on this, um, on this APT as well. Why they called it ELISA backdoor? Because of the PDB paths the devel malware developers left inside that sample, as you see here. And then they, uh, we, we spent some time um, working and uh, investigating the infiltration techniques that they use. They use different spearfish exploits. They use, they did uh, web compromises to uh, infect more people. And then they also did some watering hole uh, attacks to uh, attack more victims, some targeted victims. Uh, different spearfish exploits they use. They use PDF exploits. They still use in this kind of um, this kind of spearfish emails and uh, exploit files. PDF exploits, MS Word exploits, uh, Adobe Flash Player exploits. So they have, they have a um, good and a strong set of uh, skills and, and tools that they use for attacking the victims. And talking about uh, watering holes, and sometime in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, they compromised a website to target some organizations in Myanmar. They, um, this is the website that they targeted. And as you can see, there are some files um, that people could download from these websites. The bottom, the zip files. These files had, um, this was meant to have, um, have phone, have fonts for uh, Myanmar, uh, I mean have tools to render fonts for Myanmar font, but the, these uh, Spring Dragon attackers, they changed these uh, files and put some Trojanized files there to infect the uh, companies and organizations in Myanmar. Another one, they uh, use the Spoof Flash installer websites for some targeted um, attacks on some governmental uh, organizations in some other Asian countries. And they also put uh, the, uh, the same backdoor, which, which uh, we saw already, the Elisa backdoor, inside this um, downloaded file for uh, Flash Player. It means that it, it installs a Flash Player, but it also installs some backdoor on the victim system as well. Uh, so we spent quite some time on, uh, on the uh, techniques that they used back then. But then again, it uh, started in the beginning of 2017. Some news from the attacks um, in, on uh, Taiwan, uh, on, on Taiwan arrived from one of our partners. Uh, we improved our detections and we started receiving lots of uh, detections and lots of um, attacks happening all around APAC countries. Um, 
soon after we, uh, we started looking at them. And then we decided to investigate the attackers' techniques and toolkits again, what they have been doing all these years and what they have been implementing. So first of all, talking about the new victims. The victims are high-profile governmental organizations in APAC countries. Um, there are some political parties uh, among the um, victims. These are uh, common victims for uh, cyber espionage, as you may know. But some other um, industries that they went after was very interesting, like educational institutions and universities. A lot of universities were among the targets of a Spring Dragon. Um, why? Because I don't think universities have, um, I don't think much, many universities uh, care about security that much. They, of course, in uh, governmental organizations, they think about security and they want to have security more than universities. I don't think most of the univers uh, universities have no idea what security is and if some, sometimes some cyber attack would happen on them. And then telecommunication industry which is very important. Um, and then also some manufacturers of telecommunication industries, which is somehow going after supply chain and, and trying to be one step ahead of um, infecting um, individuals or, um, or organizations itself. So this is the map of the victims, the new victims. As you can see, almost all the APAC countries are among the targets. Mm, not Australia and New Zealand yet, but as they are expanding the targets all the time, maybe we are the next victims. Let me talk about the tool sets of uh, Spring Dragon. They have different kind of backdoors and, uh, with different characteristics and, di and, and customized um, C2 servers and customized um, details for creating service and creating persistence on the um, victims' machines. So it makes the detection uh, very difficult, as I already said, um, because the IOCs are not um, useful anymore. In some uh, system, the file is, uh, has one uh, path and a unique name. In another system, it changes and it has something else. And the C2 servers are also different from victim to another victim. Different backdoor uh, tools that they have uh, are also embedded inside uh, the installers or backdoor loaders and backdoor modules. What you see in this picture is a very old um, backdoor installer of this uh, APT actor. Um, these are the um, resource entries of the file. As you can see, the uh, file, the backdoor file is in plain text inside one of the resource entries. But it was back then in 2000. 12 or 13, they don't do this anymore. They uh, they made more. Uh, they made the tools more obfuscated and more advanced. They uh, have different encryption techniques, and they encrypt uh, backdoor files inside the backdoor loaders or backdoor injectors, um, which would inject the backdoor file into the system processes. So it makes it more difficult to find out what is going on inside this file. Uh, different, as I said, different backdoor samples have uh, customized set of C2 servers. What you see here is the um, C2 uh, configuration block of different, two different um, uh, backdoor tools of this uh, APT actor. These are all encrypted inside the backdoor uh, loaders and it would get um, decrypted with the backdoor. So it means that even if you look at the backdoor loader or installer modules, you cannot understand the uh, C2 servers because it's encrypted and the decryption routine is not inside the file. It's inside an encrypted file inside this file. But then after decryption, the, the um, C2 configuration block is usually similar from one tool to another tool. So they can, they can use different tools on the already infected victims and they can use new tools because the configuration block is somehow similar. It starts with some unique uh, strings like this, and then after decryption, it has this, uh, the um, C2 servers in this uh, structure in, in different tools, which is the same. 
different characteristics that they, in their tools um, have had all these years. They use hard-coded user agent strings. So if you want to connect to the C2 servers, it's not possible because they want to see that, that what they have implemented inside the backdoor modules. And they have also, they, they use also some custom uh, strings for um, connecting to the C2 servers. So again, it makes uh, the investigation more difficult if you want to look at the C2 servers yourself and understand what it does and what it has inside or maybe attack the C2 servers yourself. But what, what are these uh, backdoors capable of? They, they um, more or less um, uh, have the same capabilities, different tools that they have, but with different uh, style of coding and with different characteristics. So it's somehow customized from for different victims. They can update the C2 configuration file every any time they want. Um, that's why we saw some victims that has been infected for many years but um, they, they constantly um, updating the C2 configuration block to connect, to make this uh, victim connect to new servers. They can steal any type of uh, file from the system, mm, from executable files to documents to images, anything that you can imagine. They can download more malicious files and install on the system, so they can they can infect the system with more tools and more advanced tools and new tools anytime they want. They can load and run a DLL module and they can unload a previously loaded module, which means they can, um, they can clean the system after they're done or they can uninstall different applications from the system because they can uh, unload any DLL that they want with their advanced techniques. Uh, they can run any executable on the victim system. Um, so, as I said, they can download new files and install it on the system. And they can execute different system commands on the system to collect more information from the mm, system, from um, about the files, about the running processes, about the, um, I don't know, network connections, anything that they want. So they are, um, almost capable of doing anything that they want when they infect the system. Um, let's have a look at the evolution of their tool sets. They started in 2012 with, uh, with the Elisa backdoor, three version, three, uh, two vari three variants, sorry, variant A, B, and C. And then in 2013, they introduced another backdoor module, which we call it shadowless backdoor. I don't want to go into the detail of different backdoors because I don't want it to be boring. I, want to, you know, I, I just wanted to tell you the high level uh, information about these threats. And then in 2014, they started another variant of Elisa backdoor. And they also used uh, different tools like backdoor loaders and backdoor injectors to and encrypt backdoors inside these uh, modules to make it more difficult to, uh, and more ambiguous to understand what is inside the file. In 2015, um, researchers from uh, Uni42 um, group, they published a report, a thorough report about uh, this Elisa backdoor variant A, B, and C, not the other tools, and then just after the publication, the attackers stopped developing these three variants, but they, they continued using the variants and the tools that have not been reported. So that's why I don't want to tell all the details about the other tools. So they want them to still um, using them and improving them. They started n using new features to escalate privilege on the system, so they can install m their malwares on the systems with, with uh, less access. They also started another uh, backdoor tool in 2015. So ev every al almost every year they, uh, they develop new tools and new modules. And in 2017, they uh, add more features to their uh, files they add more obfuscation and, and, uh, on the 
codes, backdoor modules codes and uh, different tools that they have and also to the names and the strings which are encrypted, um, the C2 servers which are encrypted with uh, more encryption. And throughout the years, they also uh, added more obfuscation all the time to the uh, different tools that they have, they have been using. Um, so after investigating the, their tools, uh, I wanted to understand where are these uh, attackers based and what, they, what is their intention. So I, uh, as, as we usually do, do, we try to understand uh, the, um, where they have been um, registering their C2 servers, where are the malware developers based. So I looked at the C2 infrastructure. As I said, there are a lot of C2 servers uh, for this uh, APT actor, so it was easy to look um, and um, sort them out uh, among the, other, uh, among the uh, countries to see um, in, in which country they have been uh, registering their C2 servers. As you see, more than 40 persons are uh, located in Hong Kong. And then some other uh, countries are coming after that. And as you know, attackers try to use different uh, techniques or different, I mean, VPNs or different things to, um, to hide the real location. So this is not something very reliable, but um, for, for a few years and for a lot of um, C2 servers, it can mean something. Talking about the origin of the um, malware developers, I had uh, quite a lot of malware samples, like more than 700 malware samples. So I looked at the timestamps of the compilation of these malware samples, and I sorted the uh, timestamps um, uh, against uh, GMT. You can see in, in this um, histogram, you can perfectly see that the main activity is happening during the years. The main activity is happening in GMT plus eight time zone. And then there's another small, um, small smaller um, peak of activity happening in some other time zone. Maybe it's another time zone. They are doing, they are uh, operating in different uh, countries or maybe they work in two different shifts and the second one is uh, another shift in the same time zone which is starts in the evening. We are not sure. Th these are the uh, evidences that we see and we try to understand, but uh, after that, um, we cannot be certain about anything. So just to wrap it up and, uh, for the conclusion, the examples like Lazarus or this uh, Spring Dragon or other um, APTs that you saw um, before this are um, APT actors with massive scale of operation. They have lots of, they invested a lot in their tools and their techniques and the C2 infrastructure and everything. So they are not going to go away soon. They have been constantly developing and improving their tools. Um, so it's, it's not going to be as easy as it was to detect them in the future. And then different APAC countries, uh, countries and territories actually in APAC region have been among the main targets of these kind of APT actors. So it means that the advanced uh, threat actors are interested in APAC countries and it's, it, it makes APAC countries in a uh, dangerous situation. Uh, and then we are sure that these APT actors are going to continue resurfacing regularly in APAC region, maybe with more, uh, I mean, of course, with more tools, more advanced tools and more uh, targets. So if we are not among the targets yet, we might be in the next one. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. <laughs>